Today's video is sponsored by Mel Science, a monthly subscription box that combines hands-on experiments with virtual reality in order to help kids fall in love with science. Mel Science wants to break that old stereotype that science is too tedious, too heady too inaccessible. Science doesn't have to be like it was when our parents were at school, or even when we were at school, stuck in a dark wooden lab room with equations on the board. Mel knows that science should be everyone's favorite subject, and they're bringing it into three dimensions in the 21st century. So if you have a child that's six years old, and you want them to learn about how the world works in a fun and exciting way, they can try simple projects at home by following instructions laid out in a comic book by two young dino scientists. Or if you have kids who are a little bit older, they can build their own chemistry lab or run exciting physics experiments right at home. And if they want more, they can deepen their knowledge by diving into virtual reality lessons. Every kit is completely safe and thoroughly tested. There's a new kit every month, and you can mix and remix science subjects however you like. This is great for all kinds of different families. Obviously, if you homeschool your kids or if you're a parent who wants to recharge your kids' fascination with science and the world, this is a great option. But it's also just a great choice for families who are looking to spend some quality time together and do something a little bit different. That's what I did. I tried it with my kid, who's not even six yet, and we had a good time. So give Mel a try by clicking on the link below or just scan the QR code on the screen right now and you'll get 50% off the cost of your box with the promo code BRAINFOOD. So thank you, Mel Science, for sponsoring today's video. And now, well, today's video. In the pantheon of worst humans to ever live, you'll find no shortage of bastions of awful. Hitler probably has the most collective, conscious panache, but at least he had the decency to bravely and with no regard for his own personal safety infiltrate the Hitler bunker and then put a bullet through the cranium of Hitler. But individuals like Hitler did their killing via proxy. As for those who were a little more hands-on, the Hitler of these was arguably a man by the name of Vasily Blokin, who, as we've covered previously in our video, who has directly murdered the most people by their own hands, personally killed at one time over 7,000 people in under a month, let alone countless others he offed at other points in his career. Vasily and many others like him, however, killed for their respective states. In contrast, within the subset of individuals who killed by their own hand, we have a special class that in recent decades has been given the moniker Serial Killer. Which brings us to the macabre topic of today. Who was the most prolific serial killer of all time? To begin with, we should briefly discuss what classifies someone as a serial killer instead of oh, one of the other individuals who are in the world of humans. To wit, the FBI definition of a serial killer is a person who has, quote, three or more separate events with an emotional cooling off period between homicides, each murder taking place at a different location. Of course, the definition is rather lacking on a number of fronts, not the least of which is that individuals like Vasily Blokin or other decorated soldiers as he was and veterans of countless battlefields almost fit that definition, though nobody would consider them serial killers. Going a little further, it's often put forth to add someone who repeatedly kills for psychologically gratifying, often sexual reasons. Further bodying the waters are those sometimes called spree killers, whose acts may, in many cases, mirror that of a serial killer, but with the distinction generally put forth that a spree killer generally has little time between killings, or more aptly, little in the way of a cooling off period, simply going on a rampage for possibly even days or weeks, but otherwise mostly non stop until they do stop for whatever reason. And then, assuming they survive, they never take up killing again. Given all the ambiguity here, it's noteworthy that these sorts of classifications are more for media and the like, talking about these individuals and generally considered to have little benefit for law enforcement themselves. And indeed, from agency to agency, nobody quite agrees perfectly on the set definition. That out of the way, when focusing on which serial killer murdered the most people, the ambiguity mostly resolves itself given the sheer scope and time spans needed to commit their many murders, most definitely including cooling off periods and some serious mental health issues. So who was the most prolifically awful person in this way in known history? Often cited individuals include the likes of nobles such as the 15th century Baron Gilles de Ray and the 16th century Countess Elizabeth Bathory de Exeter. As for Ray's, who was a compatriot of none other than Joan of Arc, he is generally stated to have killed potentially even upwards of several hundred children for sexual gratification purposes. However, nailing down a definitive figure for his crimes is impossible. Not only this, what also might surprise many is that when digging into the matter, there is considerable question as to whether he actually committed any of the atrocities that he was tried and convicted for. 
As for the evidence against him, this on the surface seems ironclad in the form of a detailed confession from the man himself, testimonies from some of the parents, a confession from his bodyguard who was apparently heavily involved in the events, etc. However, despite having supposedly brutally tortured and murdered a truly massive number of children, there was zero physical evidence found to support this. Not so much as a scrap of clothing, a bloodstain, or bone found on his estate that could be tied to any any of the children. This is noteworthy, as it's contrary to accounts you'll read in many biographies of the man that frequently claim that the remains of 40 bodies were uncovered at his residence. Support for this claim, however, seems non-existent, and it appears to be something someone wrote at some point in relatively modern times, and everyone else just assumed it to be true without looking at the original records that show no such evidence was ever presented at the trial, nor came up in any of the primary records of the investigation. As for rape, he claimed that he burned the bodies and the remains from there were thrown into places like the cesspit or buried. It's further noted that it was not any parents of the hundreds of missing children or the likes that brought these alleged atrocities to light, but simply that Ray had gotten on the bad side of the church, who would soon after make these claims against him. A second investigation was then launched separate from that of the churches, which came to the same conclusion. Ray had kidnapped, brutally tortured, raped, and murdered countless children. In support of the skeptics, an important point to note in all of this was that the two judges prosecuting the trial, the Duke of Brittany, Jean de Montfort, and the Archbishop of Nantes, Jean de Maustra, were slated to acquire the titles to many of Ray's lands if Ray was convicted of what the church had alleged that he had done. On top of this, uh, we should probably at this point mention that he was subjected to an Inquisition-style interrogation and further threatened with pretty brutal torture if he didn't confess. On top of that, he was also threatened with excommunication from the church if he didn't confess, which for an extremely religious man as he appears to have been was no small thing, especially oh, when facing his imminent death. As Morgan State University professor of history John D. Hosler notes, all in all, the affair contains a number of pretty standard medieval tropes and accusations. Gilles' actual guilt is much held in doubt by historians today. That said, as he did technically confess and it can't otherwise be proven that he didn't do it either, he is still generally considered one of history's most prolific serial killers despite the doubt. Although exactly how many people he may or may not have killed, combined with the reasonable skepticism that he did any of it, well let's just say we're not prepared to give him the crown of King of Awful. So, moving swiftly on, we have the case of Hungarian Countess Elizabeth Bathory de Axert, who is said to have brutally tortured and killed for her own perverse pleasure several hundred individuals of the female persuasion, potentially as many as 650. If estimates are true, she would not only be a relatively rare example of a female serial killer, but also likely the most prolific serial killer of all time, except here too, skeptics note that there are some fishy things about the trial, as well as the considerable benefit to others if the enormously wealthy countess and her family's influence in the region were curtailed. Much like Ray, this doesn't necessarily mean she didn't do at least some of these things, just that there is some reason at the very least to doubt the extent and, well, maybe even the entire thing. For example, many of the testimonies given of directly having seen physical evidence of these crimes were extracted via torture, and most of the rest of the testimonies were of people saying someone else had told them that they had seen things rather than witnessing them themselves. On top of this, the man who ordered the investigation, King Matthias II, owed a massive sum of money to the Countess, but if she was convicted, the debt was going to be cancelled. For whatever it's worth, she was in the end convicted and sentenced to more or less house arrest in her castle, where she remains until her death four years later in 1614. Thus, while both of these individuals could potentially be the most prolific serial killers of all time and are frequently cited as such, in both of these cases, and indeed many other similar from the distant past, it is difficult to determine the veracity of the claims against them. So, we are otherwise going to ignore them in crowning the king. So, this all brings us to more modern and better documented times. Enter four individuals, all vying for the top spot, a couple of which are still alive and kicking, one even released from prison, then immediately absconded from his parole, and nobody knows where he is. Another who was recently recommended to be released from prison for good behavior, and he wants to get into politics, apparently, despite, as we'll get into shortly, having brutally tortured, raped, and murdered hundreds of children. Now, we'll do our best to cleanse your palate with some good vibes at the end of this one, as I think we can all agree that we're going to need it. So, okay, let's get this over with, shall we? Candidate number one on the list is often given the top spot, despite the other three individuals that we'll get to shortly, very likely having killed more. 
That said, Mr. Harold Shipman is often cited as the most prolific serial killer of all time simply because his murders were extremely well documented because he was a physician. Mr. Shipman was born in 1946 and seemingly had an otherwise normal middle class upbringing, though his mother died of lung cancer when he was 17. This is generally pointed to as a possible significant event in his later deeds, given during her decline she was administered copious amounts of morphine by a home physician to ease her suffering. Why is this possibly important? This was more or less the method in which he would kill his elderly patients, most of whom were women, though not terminally ill, as his mother had been. Mr. Shimon's particular method of murder was not unlike another famous serial killer, the nightmare nurse Jane Toppen, who had administered doses of various drugs to mostly elderly patients, generally alternating morphine and atropine in her case. She later stated she enjoyed bringing them to the edge of death and back over the course of several days or weeks before ultimately deciding to kill them. As for her motivation, this appears to have been sexual, and she apparently enjoyed crawling into bed and holding them while they died. For example, in one account of a surviving patient, one Amelia Finney, she described Toppen giving her some drug after Finney underwent an operation. Not long after taking the drug, Finney lost consciousness, but later vaguely remembered Toppen in bed with her, kissing her around her face before suddenly jumping out of bed and fleeing the room when someone was heard walking by. For much, much more on Miss Toppen, you can go see our video, The Horrific Story of the Nightmare Nurse, on our sister channel Highlight History. In any event, going back to Shipman, his dastardly deeds were first suspected by one Linda Reynolds of the Brooke Surgery in Hyde, England. In particular, she had noticed that an abnormally high number of Shipman's patients had a tendency to just up and die. The matter was ultimately investigated by the police, but no charges were filed owing to a lack of sufficient evidence pointing to the deaths being murder and not just the unlucky physician having many of his elderly patients die. Despite the investigation, after being cleared, Shipman went on with his murderous ways, which seems more than a little bizarre after the spotlight had been on him. Things became even more questionable in terms of either his intelligence or maybe just because he wanted to get caught. As his last victim, one Kathleen Grundy, he didn't just kill. On top of the murder, he created a will that not only excluded her children, but left nearly £400,000 to Shipman himself. Let's just say the authorities had collective raised eyebrows when her daughter, Angela Woodruff, brought all of this to their attention. Body exhumed, the investigators found that Grundy had diamorphine, also known as heroin, in her system. Shipman countered that Grundy had a heroin addiction and even backed up these claims with notes that he'd taken about this. Unfortunately for him, these digital files were later shown to have been written after her death and it was on. A full investigation was launched, coins the Shipman Inquiry, with the two-year investigation coming up with some startling conclusions. Among other things, the findings estimated that at least 218 of Shipman's patients had been murdered, with another couple dozen in question, but potentially to also have been murdered. For reference here, over the course of his work, a total of 459 of his patients died under his care over a 27-year span. As for the subset that died via murder, as noted, the vast majority of these individuals were elderly women, with his modus operandi being to give the patients a lethal dose of diamorphine. After he murdered them, he would go back and alter records to make it seem as if they'd been much sicker than they actually were. Four years after his conviction on 15 of the murders, Shipman was found on the morning of January the 13th, 2004, by prison officials having performed his final murder, hanging himself in his cell using bedsheets that had tied to the bars on his window. Not long before this, he had told an official he was considering killing himself, as if he lived past 60, his wife would no longer be entitled to his National Health Service pension. He was 58 at the time of his death. Now, while Shipman holds the crown in terms of relatively verifiable murders, the next three individuals are generally thought to be actually the leaders here. And even if they aren't, while Shipman's acts were reprehensible, let's just say his victims had it easy compared to the victims of the following gruesome threesome. Enter the Beast, Luis Alfredo Garavito Cabillos. Born in 1957 in Colombia, as with most serial killers, Cabeza's home life wasn't exactly awesome as a child. Frequently abused by his alcoholic father and allegedly his mother not particularly caring for him, the general environment he grew up in was one of neglect and alcoholism with a heaping of domestic violence thrown in. His school life was apparently little better, with later accounts from teachers and those who knew him there noting that while he was an eager student, he wasn't terribly gifted academically and was frequently and mercilessly bullied at school as well as almost completely ostracized by his peers. Things didn't get much better for him when a family friend allegedly began sexually abusing him when he was 12. 
If all of this wasn't bad enough, Kabir's homosexual preferences didn't sit well with dear old dad, who gave him the boot out of the house because of it. In the ensuing years, he would find various odd jobs, attempt to kill himself, attempt to get psychiatric help, and begin regularly molesting random boys. This ultimately progressed to also severely abusing the boys in other ways while molesting them, similar to what had been done to him as a child. Things progressed even further when, according to Garavito, the devil told him that he should kill the kids. His supposed first attempted murder did not, however, go well when, while attempting to lure the boy to his death, the police caught and beat him, as well as allegedly took his money, watch, and a ring that he had before letting him go. Unfortunately, long, long after he was successful, on October the 4th, 1992, he killed a boy named Juan Carlos. Now, this video is dark enough, so we're going to otherwise spare you his specific acts in any real detail. But briefly, just to give you an idea, uh, dismembering things and doing things with said members while his victims were still alive was a thing. And honestly, that is the tip of the iceberg. We they just don't want to talk about it. So we'll just sum up and say that these children were brutally tortured in some of the worst ways imaginable, as he claimed it was the only way that he could reach climax. And moving swiftly on from here, we see Garavito begin compulsively torturing, raping, and murdering boys that he came across, with his modus operandi being to do things like offer them treats, alcohol, work, etc., to lure them to a secluded area. He is also known to have murdered at least five adults, though in those cases, just for practical purposes of getting getting rid of witnesses. Garavito's luck ran out, however, on April the 22nd, 1999, when he abducted a 12-year-old by the name of John Sabagal. While he was doing his thing to the boy, another teen saw and began throwing rocks at him, at which point Garavito tried to chase after the other boy, but lost him. Ultimately, in the aftermath, the police were called. Then, long story short, Garavito was finally arrested, thanks to the fact that he'd left his underwear, shoes, and glasses at the crime scene. Significantly, his underwear had some of his DNA, and they were able to confirm that they were in fact his. Ultimately, Garavito decided to be extremely cooperative, showing the officials his journal, which had a list of 140 of his victims by name, as well as lead the police to where he stashed some of the bodies. All total, he was convicted of murdering 138 children, though the real number was thought to be much higher. And indeed, the man himself confessed to another 50 or so on top of the 140 in his book, bringing his horrid total of murders up to around 200 or so if true. Garavito was subsequently sentenced to 1,853 years and nine days in prison. However, in Colombia at the time, the maximum sentence that could be carried out was just 40 years. And because Garavito was so cooperative with the authorities, this was further reduced, and he's eligible for parole in 2023. Yes, that's a thing. On top of that, owing to, quote, exemplary behavior while in prison, as well as his willingness to take part in various studies on himself, then director of Aladibar Maximum and Medium Security Penitentiary, Cesar Fernando Carabello, he recently filed to give Garavito an even earlier release, much to the chagrin of literally everybody. However, the judge in the case was able to find an out to the whole thing, given that Garavito has not yet paid the required $41,500 restitution to the victim's families. Thus, the request for early release was denied. Excellent. Then the Colombian president, Ivan Duque, also chimed in on the matter, stating, That beast is a bandit, a criminal. He is a stinking rat who has done nothing but harm children in our country, and the destiny of that criminal is to continue in jail. I have profound indignation at the possibility that anyone would suggest that that beast leave prison. Legend. As the man himself, he seems too optimistic he will be released at some point and wants to get into politics on a platform of advocating for abused children. However, even in prison, he has to be mostly isolated from other inmates as officials are quite sure his life would abruptly end not long after if they put him with the general prison population. So let's just say we're guessing the general public is likely to have similar designs should he be released and thus, we're further speculating, unlikely to vote for him. It's also noted that apparently, as relatively recently developed, leukemia, so that may well put a damper on his political aspirations. Some people just can't catch a break. And this brings us to Pedro Alonso Lopez, who also happens to have been Colombian. And interesting aside here, the number of Colombians from around this era who are ranked among the top serial killers of all time is a fascinating phenomenon. As to why, it's conjectured that this had to do with the unrest in the region during these individuals' reign of terrors and how many impoverished children there were around and unlikely to be reported missing, allowing these individuals to get away with their reprehensible acts on a mass scale. Whatever the case, Lopez was born in 1948 in Colombia. The son of a prostitute, he seems to have been introduced to sexual acts at a rather 
rather young age and subsequently was caught by his mother fondling his little sister when he was eight at which point his mother gave him the boot not long after living on the streets he claims a man promised him food if it come with him but then instead he brutally raped him later in an orphanage he was allegedly molested by one of his male teachers though the veracity of these claims are difficult to determine whatever the case he ran away from the orphanage and turned to a life of crime ultimately resulting in him finding himself in the clink for stealing a car while in prison he was gang raped resulting in him committing his first known murders killing the three men who raped him after which he no longer had any trouble with anyone else in the prison attempting to harm him while you might think these murders would have drastically extended his stay there only two years were added upon release from prison he lived in various places including peru ecuador and of course colombia in these various locations according to him he would rape and murder about three girls a week at his peak targeting girls around nine to twelve years old as to why this age he stated because i lost my innocence at the age of eight so i decided to do the same thing to as many girls as i could he also noted his preference for ecuadorian girls because to quote this asshole i like the girls in ecuador they are more gentle and trusting more innocent he also claims he liked to occasionally go back and dig up the girls that weren't dead too long to have tea parties with their bodies nearly having to face the music in 1978 a local tribe caught him attempting to kidnap one of their children they then beat the ever loving crap out of him followed by burying him up to his neck next they intended to cover his head in syrup so that ants would eat his face unfortunately for his later victims a u.s missionary witnessed the event and managed to get the tribe to release him to the police instead not long after he was set free by the police at this point he i would later state had already raped and murdered over 100 girls in another instance in ecuador he was caught trying to abduct a girl and when those around became aware they attempted to lynch him but police intervened on this one this time they looked into the matter especially as they had a large list of missing children they had been investigating and they believed him to be part of a gang who was abducting the girls he confessed however that there was no gang and that this point had kidnapped and murdered to quote over 200 in ecuador some tens in peru and many more in Colombia Lopez backed up these claims by taking the police to around 53 of the bodies that had buried in Ambato Ecuador alone for his crimes Lopez was sentenced to 16 years in prison yep 16 years as to why such a small sentence at the time this was the maximum that could be leveled in Ecuador for murder much like Gravito after him Lopez was a model inmate and in his case this earned him two years off his sentence and he was released in 1994. it wasn't over for him yet though however as his first act was to attempt to illegally leave the country to Ecuador rather than continue to deal with him he was deported to Colombia to answer to his crimes there however upon investigation he was determined to be insane and instead of prison wound up in a mental hospital where he was kept until 1998 when he was deemed rehabilitated and perfectly sane fifty dollars bail later he was released under the stipulation that he regularly reports to the police and that's the last anyone seems to have heard of the man outside of a visit to his mother in which he apparently made her get on her knees in front of him naturally she was quite sure he was going to murder her but instead she says he blessed her and no known person has heard from him since some speculate that he didn't actually abscond at all after blessing his mother but rather locals simply took matters into their own hands and made him disappear however there is no real evidence of this or his current whereabouts whether alive or dead for the final candidate on the list of potentially the most prolific serial killer of all time we have yet another colombian one daniel camargo barbosa born in 1930 camargo is thought to have raped and murdered around 200 girls across colombia and ecuador around the same time lopez was doing the same in camargo's case his mother died when he was a baby and his father would later remarry with his stepmother apparently being the very definition of the wicked stepmom abusing him physically as well as mentally including at one point forcing him to dress as a girl and go to school that way as an adult life proceeded pretty normally at first until he found out that the woman he was going to marry was not in fact a virgin rather than leave her the pair simply teamed up to find him virgins to have sex with with his woman esperanza luring the girls in and then drugging them so that he could rape them at this stage that was all he did let him go after of course this couldn't go on forever without being caught and after five such rapes the twisted couple were arrested and convicted as for camargo he was initially given just three years for these crimes but a later judge upped it to eight upon release in the early 1970s after a bit of minor shenanigans in brazil he was deported to colombia while working as a street vendor in colombia he saw a nine-year-old girl and he decided to kidnap rape and murder her on this later atrocity he stated he decided to kill her simply as a way to help avoid getting caught 
It speculated upwards of 80 other girls in Colombia met the same fate by his hands before he was caught and convicted, sentenced to 30 years in prison, but later reduced to 25. However, this sentence was meaningless as he managed to escape prison in 1984. Over the course of the next two years, while living on the streets in Ecuador, he then raped and murdered at least 54 other girls. Noteworthy here is that he apparently made a living while on the streets by collecting ballpoint pens and reselling them, which begins to paint a picture of what happens to all those ballpoint pens that we all use, never use up, but then oh, we can never find when we simply need a pen. Serial killers simply take them and resell them, apparently. Probably take them from your home while you're sleeping. Finally, in February of 1986, directly after raping and murdering a nine-year-old girl, police discovered this douchebag carrying a bag containing the clitoris of bloody clothes of his latest victim. He would later confess to killing 72 girls since his prison break and led the authorities to various grave sites in the woods to corroborate some of this. For these crimes, he was given a mere 16 year prison sentence, once again, the maximum that could be leveled in Ecuador for murder. Unlike Garavito, Camargo was not kept from the general prison population for his protection. And unfortunately for him, and fortunately for fing everybody else, one of his victims had a relative serving time in the same prison. And said relative wasted little time stabbing and killing the 64 year old Camargo on November 13th, 1994. So at least one of these stories has a very happy ending. So there you have it, among the pantheon of awful humans, the crown king of the serial killer variety is either a physician offing his more seasoned patients by giving them copious amounts of heroin, or three Colombians who did things we wish we'd never had to read about. And now, because we ourselves need to cleanse our palate and prefer genuinely happy endings, we are going to leave you with a couple of stories of bastions of awesome. First up, we have one Albert Goering, brother of Hitler's right-hand man, Hermann Goering. Now, at this point, given his family associations, you might be wondering how Albert could be a bastion of awesome. But stick with us. Not just despising the Nazis, Albert also put his life on the line to do something about it. And particularly, as he was mostly vilified in his lifetime, he deserves to have his story told. According to the book 34 by William Burke, Albert's first known open act to help the Jews was a small one. While in Vienna, he happened upon a group of Jewish women who had a vicious mob around them and were being forced to scrub the streets. When he saw this, he simply walked up to one of the women, asked for a scrub brush from her, and knelt down and began scrubbing the street as well. This didn't sit well with the officers who were overseeing the whole thing, but when they realized who Albert's brother was, they quickly ordered the scrubbing to stop and the mob to disperse. In a similar incident, this one which resulted in his own arrest, he came upon a small mob that was harassing an elderly Jewish woman, putting a sign around her neck that stated, I am a Jewish sow. Albert pushed his way through the crowd around her and helped the woman escape the little mob. In the process of doing so, he had to physically attack two members of the Gestapo, for which he was ultimately arrested. As before, once they realized who they'd arrested, he was set free. More significantly, Albert is thought to have helped countless Jewish people by helping fund an underground movement that helped Jews escape to freedom. He also forged his brother's signature on several occasions to get Jews and others released from concentration camps and prison. Other times, he'd simply convince Herman to sign an order to let certain people go, playing on his brother's vanity for his love of displaying power. In his most daring act, he drove up to concentration camp and simply demanded to be given Jews for labor for the company Skoda Works, where Albert worked at the time. Normally, as he had no official papers for such a request, he would have been turned away. But because he was the brother of Hermann Goering, his request was granted. After loading his truck with as many Jews as he could, he drove them off to a remote area and let them go with instructions on their best route to freedom. After that, though, the jig was up and an order was sent from Berlin to have him shot. He managed to escape to a safe house, however, and the war ended very soon after. However, upon presenting himself to Allied soldiers, he was promptly arrested. Unlike his older brother, Albert was acquitted during the Nuremberg trials, though not before spending around a year and a half in prison, with no one believing him that he had actually spent the war actively working against the Nazis and helping as many people as possible escape their clutches. In fact, when he first told his story after being arrested, Major Paul Kabbalah noted in Albert's file, the results of the interrogation of Albert Goering constitute as Ever a piece of whitewash as we have ever seen. However, Albert finally did find someone willing to listen in Major Victoria Parker. He had given Parker a list of 34 Jews he knew the names of that he had personally helped escape. By an extraordinary coincidence, one of the Jews on that list was Major Parker's uncle. After verifying the claim with his uncle, the Major pursued the other names on the list who all testified in Albert's defense, and he was finally set free. Unfortunately, after the war, he found himself largely shunned due to his association with his brother and that few knew of Albert's real activities during the war. As a result, he struggled to find work for the remainder of his life and ultimately became an alcoholic. 
as his health began to fail and his death was imminent in 1966, he was dying of pancreatic cancer, Albert decided to marry his housekeeper. Seemingly a good man to his ends, this was not out of love, but simply because doing so, she would then be entitled to his government pension, making sure she would be taken care of financially after her services as a housekeeper were no longer required. He died a week later in December 1966. And finally, in slightly more modern times, Alex Bastian of Orson has saved millions of lives to date. That's one James Harrison of Australia, the man with the golden arm. As to how he saved so many, Harrison's blood contains an antibody called Rho D immune globulin that is used to treat rhesus disease, a severe form of anemia where antibodies in a pregnant woman's blood destroy her baby's blood cells. James Harrison may never have discovered this quirk in his blood if not for the fact that when he was 13 in 1949, Harrison had major chest surgery. The surgery required transfusions of almost three and a half gallons of blood. During the three months that he spent recovering in the hospital, grateful for the donated blood that had saved his life, he pledged to start donating his own as soon as he was legally old enough to, as a way to pay back the kindness of the strangers who donated the blood he used. At the time, one needed to be 18 to donate blood. In 1954, when Harrison turned 18 and started giving blood, it was quickly discovered that his blood contained a rare, very valuable, life-saving antibody that could be used to treat rhesus disease. At that time, rhesus disease was killing tens of thousands of babies per year, around 10,000 annually in the US alone, as well as causing major birth defects such as brain damage. Most people, around 85%, have a special protein in their blood cells called the Rh factor, which makes them Rh positive, positive blood type. The remainder, who lack Rh factor, are called Rh negative and have a negative blood type. Women who've been pregnant may remember the Rh blood test, which screens to detect any incompatibility. As to why this is important, as noted by the National Heart, Lung and Blood Institute, if mother is Rh negative and baby is Rh positive, mother's body will react to the baby's blood as a foreign substance. Mother's body will create antibodies, proteins, against the baby's Rh positive blood. Rh incompatibility is more likely to cause problems in second or later pregnancies when Rh antibodies can cross the placenta and attack the baby's red blood cells, leading to hemolytic anemia in the baby. Luckily, if an incompatibility is found early on, there is a prenatal treatment, Rh immune globulin, that will prevent any problems before they start. This problem works by introducing antibodies that will attach to Rh positive red blood cells. This effectively uh, makes it so the mother's immune system won't detect and then try to destroy them. And go back to Harrison. Oh, when the discovery was made about Harrison's blood, he agreed to undergo extensive tests and experiments that eventually led to the development of a vaccine called anti-D. Harrison said he was eager to help, but some precautions were taken in case something happened to him during the testing. Harrison said in a 2010 interview, They insured me for a million dollars, so I knew my wife Barbara would be taken care of. I wasn't scared. I was happy to help. Besides letting himself be used as a guinea pig in the development of the anti-D vaccine, Harrison has donated an extreme amount of plasma. Plasma can be given every two to three weeks, unlike whole blood, which is only recommended to be donated every six weeks. This allowed Harrison to donate 1,173 times in the around six decades he did it, only stopping in 2018 because Australian policy does not allow people over 81 to donate. In all, it's estimated that Harrison has helped save around 2 to 2.5 million people so far through his actions. Among that number, his own daughter, Tracy, had to have the anti-G injection after the birth of her son. We will leave off this one with a quote from Ralph Waldo Emerson on a successful life, which these former individuals failed at, and the latter succeeded. To laugh often and much. To win the respect of intelligent people and the affection of children. To earn the appreciation of honest critics and endure the betrayal of false friends. To appreciate beauty, to find beauty in others, to leave the world a bit better, whether by a healthy child, a garden patch, or a redeemed social condition. To know that one life has breathed easier because you lived here. This is to have succeeded.